When the city council took up the East New York rezoning plan earlier this spring, Rafael Espinal was the man in the middle. As the councilman representing most of the area, he was at the center of negotiations between the de Blasio administration and the council over the details of the plan. And he was the target of pressure, even protests, from those hoping to get a better deal. Now that deal is done, the city is moving on to other neighborhoods, and the future is about to happen in East New York. Let's talk about the past, present, and future of that rezoning deal with the councilman. Mr. Espinal, thanks very much for joining us here. Thanks Your a lot, seventh Jared. time on BK Live. Yeah, lucky number. I Hopefully think, this goes well. I think that beats my record. So. <laughs> um, so we've been talking about East New York for so long. Remind us what this plan was about. What, what actually was accomplished in April when this plan was passed? Yeah, well, um, Two, two or three years ago, the mayor announced that he wanted uh, to address the affordable housing crisis in the city. And the way he was going to address that was by uh, building and preserving 200,000 units of affordable housing across the city. Uh, he uh, believed that by rezoning 15 neighborhoods, he'll be able to uh, fertilize land so that we can build up. And by building up, we can create affordable housing and the new development that comes into the communities. Uh, and the way we do that is by also was is by also passing a, a set of laws that would require for developers uh, to include uh, uh, affordable housing in their in their developments and the city council passed that a few months ago which is called mandatory inclusionary housing and uh, that would uh, require for developers to put 20 to 25 percent of affordable apartments within any development that they decide to develop in a community. So uh, East New York was the first out of the 15 neighborhoods. Um, you know, we he made the announcement a little over a year ago that he wants to build uh, about 3,000 units of affordable housing along uh, commercial corridors like Atlantic Avenue, uh, Pickin Avenue, and Fulton Street. And you know, the community at first was taken aback, right? You know, they, we've heard of the concerns that uh, rezonings have brought, uh, concerns and issues that rezonings have brought in other neighborhoods. If you look at uh, Williamsburg, uh, where uh, the waterfront was, was redeveloped and only luxury housing was mostly built in that area, uh, displacing residents that have lived there for many years, displacing artists that helped a uh, culture, uh, uh, a community, artist community in that in the neighborhood, and also pushed out uh, the immigrants that had been there for a long time. And they had to move into neighborhoods like Bushwick and move into neighborhoods like Cypress Hills in East New York. So and that was the that was the setting, more or less, when you were running for, for your seat in 2013. And I'm curious, you know, at that point, Bill de Blasio was still candidate de Blasio. Was rezoning something that people in the district wanted, uh, or the things that the rezoning involves? Is that something that people had on their agenda for East New York? Was it on your agenda? No, you know, it wasn't on my agenda. You know, my, my agenda was to deliver as many resources and capital improvements into the community, into a community that has been ignored and just invested in for decades. You know, and I speak to this, I speak to this very personally because I was born and raised in the neighborhood that is that that was rezoned. And you know, I can tell you, in the '80s, we suffered we suffered through the crack epidemic. You know, in during the uh, recession, uh, we've had the highest amounts of foreclosures in the community. So this is a neighborhood that uh, was ignored by city and state governments. Uh, the only investments they really received was by previous council members who had a fight in the budget to bring capital improvements and other resources. So, you know, this wasn't on the agenda, but I saw this as an opportunity to address all of the issues that the community has been facing for many years, you know, high unemployment rates, uh, crumbling infrastructure, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, there's more affordable housing, because this is also a neighborhood that doesn't have many rent-stabilized apartments. You know, they're all pretty much homeowner, one or two-family occupied homes, where, you know, the homeowner has, a, has, has the right to uh, raise the rent as high as he wants to help pay his mortgage and help pay his other bills. So, again, you know, I saw it as an opportunity to address all of the issues that have plagued our community for decades. And, you know, I understand that the community was concerned about the word rezoning, but, you know, I think that with the tools that were given to me at the time that I decided to move forward with this, I was able to maximize that to the fullest potential to protect the current community. So let's talk about that. I know you had a list of concerns, your own concerns, obviously reflecting the communities, about the proposal the mayor put on the table. That changed over time. Uh, did it accommodate all of what you hoped it would uh, it would accommodate in the end? Like where did you win and, and where did you lose in those negotiations with the, with the mayor? Yeah, so the plan was first proposed to us, and it was pretty much bare bones, right? It was just a, a plan on rezoning these major corridors to create affordable housing. There was no real talk about, you know, how we're going to address the unemployment uh, issues, how we're going to uh, improve the crumbling infrastructure. And, and um, you know, so when I came to the table, I came to the table with those issues in mind. And they, they wanted to push for the affordable housing. 
but I told them that the only way we would push for affordable housing is by addressing these issues. So we've, and through this plan, we've, we're seeing major investments in industrial business zone. The industrial business zone currently employs 3,000 individuals at an average income of $50,000 a year. And through this plan, I was able to secure $17 million in investments to help uh, cultivate an environment in the IBZ where we can create 4,000 new jobs within the next 10 years. Um, we also talked about the, the parks and, and the roads and, and uh, the need for capital improvements there. Uh, originally, they were talking about $50 million in capital improvements. I was able to push that number to close to $267 million. I wanted to ask about that, because that's been a question in some of the other areas, too, this fund that the city has set aside for capital improvements in rezoning areas. How locked in is that money? Is that certain to happen? Is that written in, in concrete or blood? Or is that going to be sort of subject to city budget negotiations year after year? Yeah, well, I can say that currently in this year's budget, we're going to see half of those commitments being passed through this budget. And next year, I believe that the other half will be, will be put in as well and locked in. Uh, how do we hold them accountable? Uh, there's no real way we can do that by law, but we propose something different this time around. And that's creating a database where the public can track all the commitments the city has made to the community. So in the past, there was a park that was committed to Williamsburg, Bushwick Inlet Park. And so it's been 10 years since they're rezoning. They're still fighting for this park. You know, there are many reasons why the city is, is, is not able to purchase the land or, or develop the land, but the community still wants what they, was promised to them. So in East New York, the community will be able to see what was promised to them. They'll know exactly where the city is on the development of those projects, where the city is on, on, the, uh, on the budgeting of those projects. And we were able to hold the city accountable. And we also have to keep in mind that being the first was, while it might have been a curse, also a gift, because the mayor has 15 other rezonings he wants to do. And if we start yelling and screaming that they're not following under promises, that domino effect will just destroy his entire plan. <laughs> <laughs> something, something to bank on, I suppose. <laughs> Obviously, housing, affordable housing, a central issue. How many of the units will be affordable, how deep the affordability is. How far does the plan go? Does it go far enough in terms of, in your view, uh, enshrining affordability for East New York? Listen, you know, I know there's have been there's been a group in my community or in the city, I would say, that has been advocating for deeper affordability levels. Right? They wanted uh, to see 30 percent, or I forget the number, but a, a, a larger percentage of the apartments to go for individuals making uh, between thirty thousand dollars and below. Uh, the reality is, you know, that. We weren't able to accomplish that their their goal because it's not financially feasible, right? And we also take into account that East New York is not only uh, that people who are living with those income brackets. We have people in East New York who are making up to seventy thousand dollars a year, and they are at just as much uh, risk of being displaced out of the community as the people making you know, fifteen, thirty thousand dollars a year. And I say that because rents are rising in Brooklyn. You know, two thousand dollar rents are, are, are popping up in, in Cypress Hills, East New York as we speak. And these are individuals, and I can tell you this because I know them all my life, these are individuals who own their home and had no idea there was a rezoning coming into the neighborhood. They just know that the market rent, market, the market pressures in the market in Brooklyn is high enough for them to be able to, to charge two thousand dollars a month rent. So if you're making fifty grand a year, you can't afford that apartment. If you're making sixty thousand a year, you can't afford that apartment. So and that's, a, that's an interesting dynamic, actually, one that you mentioned during the council debate over the plan. I think you said something like, "If I were to den denounce this plan, stand up here and vote no, the market would keep rising." I wonder how much of, of the rise that we've seen recently in East New York is because of the market behaving organically, and how much is speculation triggered by the plan itself? As you mentioned, you know, East New York was the first plan, uh, first neighborhood named almost two years ago. Folks have known that uh, something big was happening there. Do you think that spurred some of the, the rise in prices you've seen? Um, I, I would say it, it spurred the rise in prices on land, right? So you have these speculators are coming in, and they're buying up uh, plots of land where they, where they know that can be buildable. But I don't think that uh, it had a, a, an effect on the individual homeowner that makes up the, the, the majority of the community who has one or two units above his, above his floor that is renting it out to the community. So there's a lot of factors in play. You know, I, I would, yes, I would say that the rezoning did have an effect on the price of land, but I don't think that it, it, it played a bigger role, as, as in, at least now, on, on how high rents are going into the community. You know, if you look at Bushwick, which is a neighborhood right next door, just, just a few stops away from the J and L line, you know that neighborhood uh, 
the, the rents in that neighborhood has skyrocketed over the past few years, and there has been no rezoning. There has been no government intervention. And what happened there is that now you get a three-bedroom apartment for close to $3,000, and, you know, the, again, the immigrants, the artists, the working-class families are being pushed out, and they're moving into the next neighborhood. So this was happening organically, and, yes, the rezoning did have an effect, but, again, I don't think on the rents, per se, but more on the price of land for developers to come in and purchase and build. So the rezoning is in place. Uh, that will be the case forever, unless it's changed again. What will you look look at to see if if this has worked in five years, ten years? What will be the sign to you that it's worked? What worries you now, even though you have supported this plan? Obviously, it's not perfect. What still concerns you about what might uh, play out there in your neighborhood? Yeah. Well, again, I want to say that when I when I pushed this plan forward at the end, I saw it as an anti gentrification plan. And the reason I saw that I saw it as an anti gentrification plan is because I think it addressed most of the issues that gentrification uh, has on a community. Um, if you talk about retail, modern pop shops being pushed out because commercial rents are too high. There's a plan in place here to create affordable uh, retail spaces, and the mom and pop shops will have first dibs to move into those spaces. Uh, if you talk about the homeowners who are, are being targeted and end up selling their homes because they're underwater in their mortgage or they can't pay their bills and they end up selling their houses for cash, there's a the $12 million fund allotted so that a working group from the community can come together and talk about how that $12 million could be used to help homeowners who are having issues paying their bills. Uh, if you talk about the tenants, uh, we're going to build affordable housing for people to move into. So when the wave is coming into the neighborhood, they have somewhere uh, safe and, and comfortable to stay in. So I, I think at the end of the day, we're going to see a lot more density in the community. But I believe that this will be the most inclusive and the most diverse community in Brooklyn that we have today. Just in the past couple of days, one of the next neighborhoods in the rezoning kind of lineup, uh, Flushing West, was taken out of that. The neighborhood complained, elected officials complained, and the city reacted by withdrawing the plan. Do you think that means that East New York could have said no as well? I mean, I think the, the dynamics in Flushing and East New York are very different. You know, uh, Flushing is a much more uh, dense community. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, retail. There's a lot. There's a lot of going on there that East New York doesn't have. East New York is more of a resident, residential community. And again, if I feel that I, I did have the opportunity to say no many times. But if I if I would have said no, I think it would have been irresponsible on my behalf. And my job is to make sure that I deliver as many resources to my community and also give them the tools that they need to be able to stay in Cypress Hills and East New York. You did vote yes, and there is a group of people in your neighborhood, I don't know how large, who's talked about backing a primary opponent because they are angry about your vote. Does that concern you? doesn't concern me at all. I, I, I joke all the time that they should go and knock on every single door in my community, let them know about the accomplishments I was able to deliver. Again, let, let's put this into context. You know, I was able to deliver a quarter of a billion dollars to a neighborhood that has been disinvested in for decades. You know, these are the investments that will take a councilman almost 20 years to deliver if he goes doing his job on a day-to-day, -day, right? So this happened within two years uh, of my, uh, of my um, term. And I believe that the community will appreciate everything I was able to deliver for them, because we, we have been crying and yearning for the city to actually finally pay attention to us, and the day has finally come, and I was able to deliver. So the affordable housing plan is the centerpiece of de Blasio's mayoralty to this point. He has several more neighborhoods to go through. He's in a politically difficult position at the moment. What's a lesson, quickly, one lesson from East New York that you think the administration should take? and apply it to how it approaches the other neighborhoods. Yeah, you know, I, I think that the, that the lesson that they should take is, is not announce in advance the community that they're looking to rezone. That way you keep the speculators out and you can work with the community on how the plan uh, should, should take effect and give people in the community the chance to actually start purchasing property in the neighborhoods or, or invest in the lands that, that could be buildable. That way you give them uh, the resources and tools they, they need to stay there. So again, if, if you're going to rezone, let's say Bushwick, for example, don't announce your rezone zoning Bushwick until the plan is in place and the community is, is well, well, well aware of what's happening within the next year or so. Sound advice. We'll have to have you back for your eighth BK Live appearance to, to talk about it. Hopefully, we'll give you a couple weeks off first. I would love to. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councilman, for Thank being you, here. Thank you, Jared.